self-proclaimed prophet with a sinister plan. You want to forget about the details. Unleashes horror in a quiet neighborhood. You never know what is going on behind closed doors. And that's one of the things that makes the case so scary. There are all sorts of things he wanted to involve me with. He says, you should pose nude for Playboy. You kept thinking, well, this can't get any worse. Authorities say each bag contained human body parts. But it did. It kept getting worse. I mean, not even Stephen King could have concocted something this bizarre and outrageous. your emergency? Um, I'm in Whitaker and I thought I just heard six shots on a gun go off. And then I thought I heard somebody come running down Redwood. We heard uh, someone get in a car. Woodacre, California, an affluent Marin County suburb, 20 miles north of San Francisco. Can you tell anything about the car from what you were hearing? No, nothing. Okay. Minutes later, a second call to 911. An emergency. Yes, an emergency. What's the problem? My tenant's mother and a boyfriend. Okay, I can't... Be... okay, yeah, we have officers on the way out there. Detective Steve Nash of the Marin County Sheriff's Department responds to the scene. I observed uh, a male lying on the floor next to a bed, and I also observed a female lying in the bed with a lot of blood within the scene. Investigators identify the shooting victims as Jenny Villarin and her boyfriend, James Gamble. They had been apartment sitting for Jenny's 22-year-old daughter, Selena Bishop. CSIs find a number of 9mm bullets. All appear to have been fired from the same weapon. There are no fingerprints, no trace evidence, and no apparent motive. And the mystery only deepens when investigators try to track down Selena. Selena worked at a restaurant uh, about three miles from her house. But she is nowhere to be found. Her co-workers at the Two Bird Cafe haven't seen her in days. Investigators then question Selena's friends and turn up a possible lead. We had been told that she was uh, en route to Yosemite or is already at Yosemite with her boyfriend camping. So we contacted the rangers to start checking all the campgrounds. But the lead goes nowhere. Selena's aunt, Olga Land, issues a frantic plea. Selena, if you see this, we love you, and we miss you, and we want you home. Please. We refused to even think that something had happened to her. Just losing Jenny was bad enough, so Selena was coming back. Officers try to retrace the missing woman's steps and determine that she was last seen with her boyfriend at a bar in Berkeley. Jordan. His name was Jordan, supposedly. We found out from Selena's friends and co-workers that her boyfriend Jordan was very elusive. Uh, he didn't want to be photographed. Co-workers are telling investigators about this guy she was dating named Jordan, very mysterious, no one really knows much about him, sort of this shadowy figure. In Selena's diary, recovered from the crime scene, investigators find a suspicious entry directed at Jordan. I won't want to be with you, it says, when your big plan goes down. We were very concerned for her safety and well-being especially in light of the journal entry that she didn't want to be involved with Jordan's big plan. On the day after the double murder, with Selena still missing, the sheriff's department is grasping at straws. Everybody we have interviewed at this point has not given us something that would focus us to a motive. Finding Selena's elusive boyfriend is now a top priority. He seems to be somewhat recluse in that a lot of people have not actually formally met him, a lot of people have not actually seen him. We did know based on family and friends and co-workers information that uh, 
Jordan lived with his brother, Justin, in the Concord area. Then, investigators get a break. I was advised that the missing person, Selena Bishop, had left her pager at her place of employment. I collected the pager, and we then began a process of looking through the phone numbers. There are several calls from a Justin Helzer on Saddlewood Court in the city of Concord, 50 miles from Woodacre. And sure enough, Justin lives with his brother. But his name isn't Jordan, it's Taylor. The family members were also shown a photograph of Glenn Taylor Helzer. They identified that person as the person they knew as Jordan. Police learn that Taylor Helzer once worked as a stockbroker at Morgan Stanley's Concord office. He's now unemployed. Justin, a cable TV installer, is also out of work. We then began a, a firearms check of Justin Helzer and noticed that he had purchased a firearm a few months before, the Beretta 92 9mm caliber handgun. Suspicion of the Helzer brothers is now running high, but detectives need more evidence, and what they're about to discover will blow the whole investigation out of the water. Two days after the double murder in her apartment, friends and family are still asking, where is Selena Bishop? Police believe the answer may lie inside the Concord home of her boyfriend, Taylor Helzer. Concord PD officers were asked to help out the Marin County Sheriff's Office. W serving a search warrant on an address uh, in Concord, pursuant to one of Marin County's homicides. At the time, Concord PD was also busy with a missing persons case involving an elderly couple, Ivan and Annette Steinman. They were married almost 55 years. They were, you know, enjoying life, and they were, you know, a, a great pair. I would call every two or three, you know, times a week, something like that. Nancy couldn't reach her parents. And I called, and I called, and I kept ringing, and it just, the phone would just, um, just it wouldn't answer, wouldn't pick up the answering machine. Nancy went to her parents' house to investigate. And as I walked up, I noticed that the van was gone, so I knew they were gone. I walked up on the porch, and I'm trying to step over all these newspapers, and I'm thinking, well, there's, they must have gone on a trip or something. Everything looks okay at first glance. And I went into the kitchen, and I saw a, a bowl in the sink, and it had mold all over it. So I knew it had been there a while. And, I, and th that's not Mama. She would not do that. So I knew something was wrong. She called the police. And they came out, and they asked me if I wanted to do a missing persons report. And I said, well, yeah, just for the record, I guess so, because we're still thinking that they have gone on a trip somewhere. But the next day, police found her parents' van abandoned in a seedy area of Oakland. I kind of fell apart because I knew that that was not my parents. There was one more thing telling me that that's not the right thing, that they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't just leave it there. I mean, at this point, they still haven't really, you know, investigators really still don't know what they've stumbled upon. They just know something weird is going on. Police have to wonder if the Steinman case could be related to Selena Bishop's disappearance. It's time to pay the Helsers a visit. On uh, the morning of August 7, 2000, we assembled to execute the search warrant. The Concord Police Department, as well as our detectives, set up perimeters around the residence. I, along with two other detectives, were on the back side. There was entry teams on the front of the residence. They forced entry into the residence. Police take Justin Helzer and a female identified as Dawn Gottman into custody. Taylor makes a break for it. I saw an individual come out the back bedroom window in his underwear. He jumped over the fence and started directly towards me. I immediately uh, pointed my revolver at him and he laid down on the ground at which time he was handcuffed. One look around the house and police know they're onto something. You've got like this weird stain on the living room carpet. 
You've got professional dry cleaning machines like blown hot air trying to dry the carpet. There were these reddish brown stains that were tested and presumptively indicated that there was, they were blood. A closer examination of the residence revealed uh, several items of interest, such as duct tape, latex gloves, leg irons, and handcuffs. The house is in complete disarray, with one exception. The bathroom itself uh, seemed very clean, inordinately clean. It was apparent that somebody took great time and care to clean up that bathroom. Investigators discover a wide variety of cleansers and industrial deodorizers. We found a lot of receipts where they were buying cleaning products at various different stores. They also recover four brand new duffel bags and receipts for nearly a dozen more. Then, inside a safe, a pivotal find. We recovered the murder weapon of Jennifer Villarn and James Campbell. It's the Beretta 92 9mm handgun Justin Helzer had purchased. So that, they've got a connection now between the Helzers and the Villarin Gamble murders. The payday doesn't end there. Our detectives obtained within the residence documents related to the missing couple, Ivan and Annette Steinman. There were various written documents related around money uh, and banking financial institutions. Investigators recover four checkbooks belonging to the Steinmans, as well as statements from their six-figure account at Morgan Stanley. So instantly, that gets investigators' interest. And it's from there, it's like all these arrows just start pointing at the Helzer boys. The Concord uh, Police Department developed latent prints on uh, Mr. and Mrs. Steinman's van. We have recovered fingerprints off of the van. Uh, they are the fingerprints of Dustin Helzer and Don Godman. At police headquarters, it looks like Taylor Helzer is going to come clean. I've got a lot to tell you regarding uh, Selena and Ivan and Annette and myself. But soon, the only person talking is Helzer's court-appointed lawyer. He's very severely disturbed, is what he is. Investigators now believe that something horrible has happened inside the house on Saddlewood Court. It just shows you that human nature is completely unpredictable. You never know what is going on behind closed doors. And that's one of the things that makes the case so scary. Five days after the shooting murders in Marin County, California, police have the Helzer brothers and Don Godman in custody. Investigators believe the trio is also responsible for the disappearance of Selena Bishop and Ivan and Annette Steinman. It's a very bizarre scheme. At the center of it, you have Glenn Taylor Helzer. Big personality, very charming, knows how to draw people in. But what's the motive? As investigators delve into the suspect's backgrounds, the story only gets stranger. Taylor Helzer and his younger brother Justin grew up in Martinez, about 50 miles north of San Francisco. Karma Helzer doted on her oldest child. Karma believed from the time that she was carrying Taylor that she had a very special being in, inside of her. From the time he was very young, he evidently exhibited uh, a maturity, awareness. He had kind of a presence. And he was raised in the confines of the Mormon church. Very strict Mormon upbringing. He was ordained in the church when he was 12. He was called to the priesthood when he was 18. Their family life was unusual, to say the least. They went on survival camp trainings where they learned to live in the wilderness and live off the land and build forts and that kind of thing. So when the end of days did happen, um, they'd be prepared. To other people, they're very bizarre. By all accounts, Taylor was a devout Mormon. Not only is he good at quoting the scripture, but he, he studies the Book of Mormon constantly. And he stays up all night at times studying this book. By the mid-90s, Helzer was a rising star in the church and a successful stockbroker at Morgan Stanley with a Rolodex full of clients like the Steinmans. He and his wife had two daughters. Life appeared to be good. But he feels like something's missing. This, this isn't the calling that he's, he's been chosen to answer. What really profoundly changed him 
was when he uh, attended uh, uh, the impact type trainings. Investigator David Sullivan learns that both Taylor and his brother were advocates of a self-awareness program called Harmony Impact. Impact stated purpose is to allow you to break through your fixed beliefs, your fears, uh, your conditioning from your family and society that prevent you from being who you really are. You put people in a room, you cut them off from uh, anything in their life that may ground them. You want to go uh, absolute control for hours at a time. You're shouted at, you're screamed at, you're instilled with fear, insecurity. You're broken down. You lose your sense of self. And Taylor really took to these courses. He likes the he liked the aggressiveness of it, and he liked sort of the underlying message of there is no right, there is no wrong, there's only what works. For Helzer, that meant putting his own spin on the teachings of the Mormon church. Taylor intensively studied scripture and began interpreting it in his own rather idiosyncratic way. You know, it's almost like it was a time bomb in his head that just sort of went off at a specific moment. And he realizes that he's basically been missing out. And he wants to try the sinning lifestyle. He wants to drink, he wants to smoke, he wants to try pornographic sex. Helzer's marriage broke up. In early 1998, he started seeing a waitress named Carrie Furman. Investigators track her down and question her about Taylor. And I thought, this is a cool guy. Very much a gentleman, very polite. And he was good looking. Relationship starts and eventually, her and Glenn and Justin, they move into a house in Walnut Creek, and things progressively start getting weirder from this point out. Taylor changed his appearance dramatically and his behavior. He grows his hair longer, he stops showering. Helzer was no longer Morgan Stanley material. He's showing up to work, unshaven, unbathed. He's sitting at his computer mumbling to himself, babbling away incoherently. He got taken off work for being diagnosed bipolar. Did you know at that point in time that he was faking? Yeah. And how did you know that? Because he talked about doing it. It's really hard to pinpoint when this certain thought process starts taking place inside his head, but he does start thinking that he's divinely inspired. and. He starts to believe he, he is some sort of prophet. A prophet who'd been put on Earth for a special mission. We were just falling more and more in love with each other. He went through this course, Harmony. He put me through this course. His parents went through it. His brother went through it. Everyone I knew went through it. Police learn that Taylor even came up with his own version of the Ten Commandments, called the Twelve Principles of Magic. They state things like, I, I am already perfect and therefore I can do no wrong. I gain control by losing all control. There is no right or wrong, only what works for me. Combing through the Helzer brothers' records, investigators uncover a paper trail of bizarre money-making plans and scams. He seemed to just develop this huge, um, you know, kind of a velocity that took him very fast, very far uh, away from uh, his, his, his standard moral precepts. One of the plans he comes up with is the Feline Club, and this would be a club where attractive young professional men can hook up with hot young prostitutes and score ecstasy and have sex with these girls for thousands of dollars. By this time, Taylor's girlfriend Carrie had left her small town waitressing job for a big time opportunity in the city. She's working as a stripper in San Francisco and he says, hey look, you taking off your clothes, what, you know, let's, put, let's make some money out of this. You should pose nude for Playboy. It's a good idea. So we just took a few Polaroids. Very sick, very sick, very sick. <laughs> She's in the house one day and she walks past the sofa where Taylor's sitting. <laughs> Oh, that's sick. Hey. Slaps Carrie Furman on the ass and says, hey, there goes my meal ticket. There are all sorts of things he wanted to involve me with. Like what? 
recruiting girls to be strippers. And that's where Carrie drew the line. I had just gotten involved with Playboy. And if he were to get caught, that would shatter my career. Furman decided she wanted out. But by this time, Taylor had found another disciple, Don Godman. I just didn't understand why he was hanging around Don all the time. So I guess, like, I was jealous. Furman moved out of the picture and into the pages of Playboy as Miss September 2000. And Godman quickly took her place in the Helzer household. Don Godman's a very sad soul. Uh, she's raised up north in gold country, sort of a sad childhood. Godman married young. She's like 17 or 18 years old, and there's a lot of stress involved, and the marriage doesn't work. In December of 96, she tries to kill herself with sleeping pills, and she fails, and she ends up in a mental health ward for three days. And while she's there, she realizes, I don't want to die, I, I want to live. As part of her redemption, Godman joined the Mormon church. And then walk the Helzer brothers, all decked out in black with their ponytails and their trench coats, and everyone sort of gives them a wide berth, uh, except for Don Godman. She was instantly mesmerized by Taylor Helzer. Some women who are overweight are lonely, and they respond well to that kind of attention. And certainly with Taylor, he didn't just give someone attention, he, he enveloped them. They get very close. They move into a house together. By this point, Taylor Hauser has met Selena Bishop. They met in April 2000 at a rave where he's selling ecstasy. Selena was smitten. She'd write things in her journal about how much, you know, she loved this guy. Waiting for you, Selena wrote to Taylor in her journal. My toes curl in ecstasy. I wish we could be together. Why is it so difficult? She knew he was shady. She knew he was dealing ecstasy. Um, but it just, it didn't matter to her. It is now a week into the investigation. Detectives fear that they may never find Selena or the Steinmans. Until a horrific discovery cracks the case wide open. There's always something new. And you just, when is this going to end? When is this, the, the horror of this going to end? And it, it, it just never really seemed like it was going to. August 2000. Taylor Helzer, his brother Justin, and Don Godman are under arrest for the double murder in Marin County, California. The whereabouts of Selena Bishop and the Steinmans remain a mystery. You kept thinking, well, this can't get any worse. It's impossible to get worse. But it did. It kept getting worse. Though investigators are convinced that someone was killed in the Helzer home, without the bodies, it will be nearly impossible to make their case. But their luck would change. In a river near Sacramento, a jet skier makes a grisly discovery. I received a phone call that several duffel bags had surfaced in the Sacramento Delta. Inside, dismembered human remains. Over the next several days, Police recover a total of nine bags from the water, all with the same gruesome contents. Authorities say each bag contained human body parts, now identified as those of three missing people, Marin County's Selena Bishop and Concord couple Ivan and Annette Steinman. Why? The child's question? Why? It was really, it was hard to keep to keep, well, you had to keep going because then you had no other choice. At that point, I was, uh, I couldn't believe how grotesque that these murders were. I doubt that any law enforcement officer involved in this case ever experienced anything to this magnitude. There are a number of leads that Concord and Marin County Sheriff's Office continue to follow up on. Before I go. I think it's prudent for us to at least try to answer some of those more fundamental questions before we make some definitive decisions about charges. One of the biggest unanswered questions is whether Selena was involved in the plot to go after the Steinmans or whether she was duped. 
Investigators learn that in early August, Dawn Godman attempted to deposit two of the Steinman's checks, totaling $100,000, and made out to Selena Bishop. It is believed that she was very naive and opened the accounts to help her boyfriend. I believe that Selena Bishop's role was, uh, was never a nefarious one. I feel reasonably certain that not later than the time the Steinmans were killed, it became apparent to the Helsers that uh, Selena knew more than, than was safe for them. And I believe that's why she was killed. That theory is supported by Selena's own journal entry about not wanting to be part of Helzer's plan. Police believe that Taylor masterminded that plan months before he even met Selena, and that he used religion to justify it. He start a lot of his sentences off with spirit says so-and-so. Spirit says indicating that God was channeling information through him. This is a guy who believed he was a prophet of God. And you've got Justin Hauser and Don Godman who believe he is a prophet of God. And if you believe that the guy you're conspiring with is a prophet of God, who thinks the prophet of God is going to get busted? The Helzer brothers and Godman are charged with murder, extortion, and false imprisonment. If convicted, they could face the death penalty. Justin Helzer's lawyer denies all the charges. He's never killed anybody, he's never hurt anybody, he's never had any interest in, in uh, extorting money out of anybody or stealing from anybody. Taylor's lawyer, on the other hand, contends that her client is insane. He's severely mentally disturbed. He's uh, just a very distraught, sad. I mean, he's horrified about what he hears and you know, what people tell him was happening. But that ploy collapses when jail authorities uncover Helzer's letter to Playboy magazine, offering an exclusive story on the case for $400,000. I mean, Glenn Taylor Helzer, at his core, is a narcissist. I mean, he's a total raging egomaniac. And remember, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's just what works for you. With the trials approaching, Karma Helzer supports her sons. Call upon the powers of heaven and earth to bring forth the impeccable truth. It seems that everyone has something to say, except Dawn Godman. She was reluctant to divulge any information about her participation in Harmony. Uh, and she wouldn't divulge much information about her relationship with uh, Taylor Helzer other than to affirm that he was a prophet. Investigators believe that Godman has been brainwashed and they solicit the help of a cult expert. She was so happy because she thought I was there to save her, that I had been sent by Taylor and, and you know, and, 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 and via the, the Harmony Impact program. You know, I was an emissary to kind of liberate her. It takes weeks to steer Godman back to reality. When Dawn uh, attained a, a level of deprogramming that she uh, realized uh, these terrible crimes she participated in, the remorse was very powerful. And um, from that point on, she made the decision that uh, she wanted to do anything she could to um, atone for it. Godman's lawyers cut a deal. In exchange for her testimony against the Helzer brothers, the DA agrees not to pursue the death penalty against her. Godman is finally ready to tell her story, and it's even more horrific than investigators expected. I mean, not even Stephen King could have concocted something this bizarre and outrageous. Taylor Helzer and his brother Justin face death sentences for their alleged roles in the murders of five people. Former accomplice Don Godman is finally ready to talk. Taylor had a list of people for when he used to be a stockbroker. He had copies of different people's accounts that he used to manage. He was going to kidnap them to get all their records, get them to liquidate their account and find someone else to deposit the money, and then withdraw it for him. Taylor thought he'd found the perfect accomplice in his starry-eyed new girlfriend, Selena Bishop. The money from the liquidated brokerage account was going to be deposited into her bank account. She was supposed to withdraw the money in cash and bring it to Taylor. The Helzer brothers and Godman called themselves the Children of Thunder. 
Together, they kidnapped the Steinmans from their home in late July 2000. I didn't feel like they were scared at one point. Annette actually said that she thought it was all a practical joke. The Steinmans were handcuffed, put in leg irons, and driven to the Helzer house in their own van. Taylor told them he needed their money because he was in trouble and had to get out of the area. Taylor brought all the account records in the room with us. He spread it out, was figuring out which stuff could be sold and which stuff couldn't be sold. The next day, Don Godman, pretending to be Annette Steinman, calls up Morgan Stanley and says, you know, I want to liquidate all my accounts. Uh, our granddaughter is having emergency surgery on the East Coast and we need money to pay for it. The Steinmans were then forced to write out two checks to Selena Bishop, totaling $100,000. With that, the Helzers and Godman had all they needed from Ivan and Annette Steinman. That's when they were given the row hypnol. The purpose of the sedative was to make the uh, murder easy uh, so that there was no struggle. Justin and Taylor carried Ivan and Annette into the bathroom. <sighs> Glenn and Justin strip down to their underwear because they don't want to get blood on their clothes. The Steinmans were viciously beaten. There was no natural repugnance, remorse. It seemed like a, a necessary step. The horror of it, of seeing your wife being beaten, and the horror of watching her life, her blood drain right out of her. Taylor picked Annette up and kind of draped her over the bathtub and took a knife and slit her throat. Basically, she just drowned in her own blood. Ivan Steinman succumbs to a, a heart attack. The bodies are dismembered in the bathroom. There was a big piece of plastic spread out on the floor in Justin's room. And on top of the plastic was black plastic trash bags, and they had body parts in them. According to the Harmony precepts, which Don, Justin, and Taylor accepted, there are no victims. All the people who were murdered chose that end. So there's no guilt involved. The next morning, Don drove to a nearby bank. A woman later identified as Don Godman wheeled herself in, uh, in a wheelchair to the uh, branch, uh, wearing a big floppy hat, uh, multicolored uh, clothing and tried to deposit several checks that were on the Steinman's account into the account of Selena Bishop. Taylor had me buy the outfit. He told me to find something that was eccentric looking because people would pay less attention to me if I looked like I was nuts. Godman went to the bank manager and repeated the story Taylor had concocted for her. You know, I'm a friend of the Steinmans. Their daughter, Selena Bishop, needs open heart surgery down in San Diego, but doesn't have insurance, so we have to pay for it. So these are these checks. Can you please deposit these into Selena Bishop's account? I didn't feel like she was really going for it, and I wheeled out of there. The bank put a hold on the checks. The funding didn't, uh, wasn't released to Don Godden. Taylor knew that something had gone wrong with the money in the bank, and his plans were not going the way he thought they would. In her last journal entry on August 2, 2000, Selena Bishop eagerly anticipated her date with Taylor Helzer that night. Taylor called and he said he was on his way with Selena. We knew that once Selena came into the house, that she would never leave again. So, Selena goes into the house in Saddlewood and she has no idea what's happened there. Taylor told Selena he was going to give her a back rub. And while he's massaging her back and she's sort of nice and relaxed, Justin walks up behind her and with a hammer and smashes the back of her skull and... Justin hit her five or six times in the head with a hammer. And Justin and Taylor picked her up and carried her into the bathroom. Taylor pulled her neck back and he said, Spirit says you get to watch and know it's real. And he slit her throat. Godman spent the next few hours trying to clean up all the blood as the Helzer brothers repeated the same gruesome act they had carried out on the Steinman. It was now early in the morning of August 3rd. 
So they've now got Selena, Ivan, and Annette in this house. The body parts are put into nine different duffel bags, and they intermingle the body parts. Friggin' this will make identification really difficult if and when these bags are ever discovered. <sighs> and Glenn Hauser realizes, hey, Selena Bishop's mom knows who I am. Jenny Villarin had met Taylor Helzer just one time. But that was her death certificate. That was a reason for him to get rid of her. He knows that Jennifer Villarin is house-sitting at Selena Bishop's apartment because Selena's meant to be off on this trip in Yosemite. So Jennifer Villarin's looking after the apartment while Selena's gone. While Justin scrubbed the bathroom clean, Dawn and Taylor drove to Selena's apartment. He has a key to the apartment. He walks in. Godman stayed in the car. Villarin's in bed uh, with her boyfriend, James Gamble, who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I sat there, and I heard the shots from the 9 millimeter. Taylor emerged, got in the car, and Godman drove them home. We got back to Saddlewood, and it was light by the time we got back. Now they had to get rid of the dismembered bodies. They've already got this plan that they're going to go out onto the uh, San Joaquin Sacramento Delta and dump the, um, dump the bags in the river. They've rented a jet ski for this purpose. They take stepping stones from the backyard, put them in the bags to weight the bags down. Justin and Taylor carried the bags out to the pickup truck and put them in the back of the truck. We all got in the truck. We drove to the Delta. A camera at a toll booth took a picture of the truck as it headed to the river's edge. While the brothers launched their jet ski, Godman drove the duffel bags to a secluded location nearby. They pulled up and got off and went and got the two duffel bags out of the truck. and they took off in the water with them. They repeated the routine until all nine bags were dumped in the river. After they dump the bodies, they stop off at one bar and have a shot of tequila, and then they go to another place and they have dinner. Later that night, they drove the Steinman's van to Oakland. We figured that someone would just steal the van if we left the keys in it. It was now August 4th. In the last 24 hours, the Helzer brothers and their accomplice had brutally murdered five people. How were you feeling at that time? Very spiritual, very, very at peace. Why? Because I felt like I was doing what God wanted me to do. I felt like I was following the spirit. Even if that meant that people were going to die, innocent people were going to die? Even if that meant people were going to die, in the summer of 2004, Taylor Helzer and his brother Justin are tried separately for the murders of five people. They were evil, they were brutal, and it was for nothing but greed. All these people, these innocent people, were murdered for $100,000. That equals $20,000 a body. When the trials actually began, uh, there are no ponytails anymore. Um, you know, Justin was tried first, uh, Glenn was tried second. Very uh, clean cut, shaven, you know, cardigans or suits and ties. Don Godman, already sentenced to 38 years to life in prison, testifies against both brothers. I mean, the, the tragedy of Dawn Godman is that she was just so lonely and desperate for friendship and attention. And she came across Glenn Hauser, who knew this and was just able to easily sway her. Justin Helzer pleads guilty by reason of insanity. He was just very, um, I guess, uh, stoic's the wrong word, but he, he was just like this cold block of ice, basically. He didn't register. The insanity plea fails. Justin Helzer is sentenced to death. 
Then it's Taylor's turn. A lot of us thought there'd be theatrics at the defense table, but there was, there was none of that. In a surprise move, Taylor pleads guilty just before the start of his trial. The jury hands down five death sentences against him. He cried and he sort of pleaded and uh, you know gave this ram long rambling speech on how the uh, death penalty doesn't fix problems and it was like he was almost like really groveling. The Helzer brothers are now on death row in San Quentin prison, just a short distance from where they carried out their murderous plot. I, I drive by uh, San Quentin all the time. I have a strong feeling because they are young that uh, they will outlive me before the executions are carried out. When I drive by San Quentin, I think about Selena Bishop, Ivan Annette Steinman, Jennifer Villarin, and James Gamble. And I think about those people. You know, they won't be driving past San Quentin. Uh, that the Helsers are in custody, that's good. This case will stay with me till the day I die, I'm sure. I mean, this is not one you're going to forget. However, there's pieces of it that you just intentionally forget. You, you, you have to. I mean, I couldn't imagine day in and day out what some of these family members have to still live with. There's no closure. When you walk out of the store and you get a glimpse of your niece, and you have to look back again and you realize it was just a sight, it wasn't her, you know. Oh, you see your sister at every turn, but your sister's not there. There, There's an ending, and then you go on from there. You have to go on. That's what mom and daddy would have wanted out of our lives, to go on, to go on and live our lives. But closure, no. People can be so cruel, so calculated, so monstrous, you, you want to forget about this. You want to forget about the details. We just wait for the next case and hope a case like this never ever comes again. <laughs>